Hello everyone and thank you for tuning in to Towergate. It is day 218, Wednesday, October the 11th, 2017. Uh, I want to say hello out there to uh, all my normal subscribers, of course. It's uh, good to be with you guys again. But uh, also to some of the new subscribers in the past uh, week or so since this Las Vegas shooting has happened. It looks like I've picked up an, a few new subscribers or some new viewers out there in my video. So I want to say hello to all you guys and uh, welcome to my channel. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, today is, of course, the top uh, news story. The top top billing today is still the Las Vegas shooting, and uh, the facts that continue to seep out, uh, as they always do, the drip, drip, drip. And it uh, looks like the official narrative is really struggling now to stay alive. I don't know if any of you saw the most recent press conference, was, which happened Tuesday evening with the sheriff and that kind of creepy looking FBI guy standing over his shoulder. We're going to talk about him in a minute. But um, it looks like that sheriff is getting pretty rattled. I know he's probably pretty tired. He appears to be under a lot of stress as well. Um, you can certainly appreciate that. I mean, he's the deep state's probably doing a job on him right now. I think he's an honest guy and probably wants to, you know, get to the bottom of this and understand what happened. But I'm sure he's under a tremendous amount of pressure from the deep state, particularly the FBI, uh, is pretty much running the show, and uh, but they've got him out there as the point man to try to sell the narrative, and um, he is doing his best, I think, uh, to try to wade through this thing as best he can. Again, he's answering to the FBI right now. They're running the investigation. Um, but the press conference was uh, pretty interesting, and there was one major bombshell that came out of the press conference. So let's go through a couple of the points from that press conference. <clears throat> First of all, I guess the most uh, alarming thing that came out of the press conference is that the timeline has changed. And the sheriff said, hey, you know, yeah, it's a change or whatever, but, uh, you know, this is what happened and this is what we're learning. And what we're talking about here, and I'm sure most of you have heard this by now, is that this security guard, we were led initially to believe that the security guard heard shooting, got up there on the floor, went to the door, the shooter shot through the door and hit the security guard, and then the situation continues. But we're now learning that that is not what happened. That part of the official narrative is gone. The new narrative is, according to the sheriff, that the security guard was alerted to, an, to a door that was ajar or not closed or not secured. And so, as a uh, routine practice of the hotel, this security person went up to the floor and it wasn't uh, the door of the shooter's room, it was another door. He went up there initially uh, to um, check on a unsecured door. And remember, at this point, no shooting had happened in the Mandalay Bay Hotel. So the security guard goes up there, and it's while he's up there that he encounters, I guess has the encounter with the alleged shooter, who then shoots him. And this was a full six minutes prior to the beginning of the uh, shooting that was uh, being aimed at the crowd, obviously. So this changes the timeline, and this also ask, has you ask quite a few interesting questions. So if, in fact, the security guard gets shot, and then it's six minutes before the shootings uh, began on the crowd, and we know that the security guard alerted another security person who had come up there, and he told him, hey, but you basically I've been shot. Don't go down there. There's something going on. There's a guy with a gun or whatever. He shot me, whatever. So we had a few minutes before the shooting even started when they were first alerted that, that this security guard had been shot on that floor in the area near where the alleged shooter's room was. So now they, they knew uh, minutes before the shooting began and certainly as the shooting was going on, this information had to have gotten to some authorities that one of their security guards had been shot on the 32nd floor. Yet we have 72 minutes goes by before they get a SWAT team up there. Why did it take 72 minutes to get a SWAT team up there when they should have known where the shooter was because a security guard had been shot six minutes before the actual shooting began. And this information had to have been relayed to somebody within, say, what, 10 minutes 
I mean, how long does it take for the hotel to report that one of their security guards has been shot by someone in the hotel on the 32nd floor? Yet, we have the cops down in the crowd as the shooting is begin and is happening, is going on, trying to find out where the shots are coming from. They should have known where the shots were coming from. And why did it take them 72 minutes once they had already identified that there was a shooter on the 32nd floor? Now keep in mind, regardless of what may or may not be going on here, these cops, they're not in on whatever is going on here. If this is some sort of a sting operation gone bad or false flag or whatever you want to look at this as, regardless of how you, how you want to look at it, clearly from what the sheriff said in his press conference, it's hard to imagine that they did not know where a shooter was based on the fact that the security guard was shot six minutes before. And this is the sheriff's words that I'm giving you. Watch the press conference. Six minutes before the actual shooting started, the security guard is hit. And he relates this to another security guard who comes up to that floor. And you have to assume that they got communications with the front desk. They had to call down there immediately and say, hey, so-and-so has been shot. There's some guy up here with a gun, obviously, shot my buddy here. You know, you better get the police or whatever. You know, so the the idea that uh, that the people in charge did not know there was something going on, it's really hard to believe. And why it took so long uh, to find out where he was when they knew that a security guard had been shot on that floor is amazing. Now, I can understand why the cops down in the crowd or cops around the area didn't really know because they're not part of any of this. Remember the cops, they're in the they're in the they're in the zone where they could be shot too. You know, it's so it's you know, it's not like the entire police force is in on whatever was happening. These rank and file cops, they they're just like cops. You know, they don't they don't know what the hell's going on. They're down there in the crowd taking fire. And maybe they are trying to fig figure out where the fire's coming from. Yeah, they're looking around like where the hell's the bullets coming from? But someone at that hotel had, had to have known that one of their employees was shot within minutes before the shooting even started. They had to place a phone call. You know, when one of your employees is shot by someone at the hotel, you would think that the next number they would call would be 911. <laughs> call the police. Hey, one of our security people has been shot on one of the floors of our hotel. You know, and moments later, you're getting, you know, machine gun fire coming out of, uh, coming out of that room uh, on that floor. So there's a lot of things here that are starting to crack up. The narrative is just, it's um, its a big problem at this point. And again, uh, they can throw out a ton of information, lots of disinformation, the whole nine yards. They can do it all. But ultimately, if the narrative is going to be, at the end of the day, a single shooter and that the shooter's nest was the room 135 on the 32nd floor, then those six to eight hundred rounds that were fired had to all be fired from that room according to the official story which means that we should have the evidence technician who's there to photograph and collect the evidence should have somewhere between 600 and 800 spent cartridges and they should have photographs of these spent cartridges that's what I'm waiting for I also am waiting for someone to actually piece together a video that gives you the entire 10 minutes uncut. It's hard with cuts in it to tell what's going on. What we need is the entire 10 minutes of video uncut so that we can time with a stopwatch the total amount of time elapsed in the shot bursts. Because remember, it wasn't 10 minutes of solid shooting. You had shooting, then a pause, shooting, then a pause, shooting, then a pause, constant pauses in here. We need to know how many minutes of actual shooting was happening and how minutes of pause that we had because that will give us the basis for a mathematical formula whereby we can determine whether or not one gun could have fired all those rounds and that will help us understand what type of a weapon it was or weapons currently what they're trying to show us in the picture I haven't heard the sheriff specifically identify the weapons but we can see what they show us in the picture that they have presented uh, to the public is a M4 and an AR-15. The AR-15 has no clip in it. The M4 has a 30 round clip in it. And they're telling us from people who've been in the room that he had many, many magazines, dozens and dozens of magazines, 
preloaded and stacked against a wall. So they are telling us that there were magazines. So we are talking about them trying to tell us that these were uh, guns that were fed by magazines, that they were semi-autos with uh, possibly some modifications to them with a modified buttstock. But once you get the total amount of math together and you get the total amount of time that the shots rang out, subtracted from the pause time, then we can get an actual idea of exactly how many rounds had to, had to have been fired per second. And that will tell us whether or not the weapons they're showing us would be capable of that intensity of fire. And of course we need to see the evidence technicians photographs and the his sworn signature and statement verifying that he has acknowledged the evidence of the shell casings and the total number of shell casings found and it should be between at least 600 it's got to be more than that it's got to be somewhere in a 700 800 maybe more probably no less than 700 because with 59 victims who were killed as well as 500 plus who were wounded as well as all the other shots that missed and hit other other sol solid objects, we're, we got to be talking somewhere in the 750 800 range minimum. And every single one of those rounds, we should we should be able to tell exactly how many rounds he fired. If that was the only shooter's nest, and he was the only shooter, then every damn one of those every one every damn one of those uh, shell casings should be on the floor in that room and should be counted. We should know the exact number of shots that were fired. And pretty soon we should know the exact amount of elapsed time that the shot burst lasted. These are two very important variables that we need to plug into the mathematical equation to determine whether or not the official narrative can work, whether or not it can even work. We're going to be distracted with a lot of information, a lot of disinformation, misinformation coming from every which direction. This is to confuse us. Let's not lose sight of the fact that if it looks like a duck and walks like a duck, it's probably a duck. It is probably exactly what it looks like. And again, you can have all the stories and all the interviews with people who knew him, people who didn't know him. Did he drink? Did he not drink? Did he do this? Did he do that? Blah, 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 blah. How many rounds were found? in the shooter's nest, what was the total elapsed time of the shooting, and what does the ballistics report, what weapons are matched to the rounds that were fired that hit the victims. These simple facts, these simple facts alone will tell us 90% of the story. They're still looking for the motive. May I suggest to the sheriff the reason maybe why you're not finding a motive is because the guy that you're trying to find a motive for maybe didn't do the shooting. You're looking for the motive on the wrong person. I wonder if he ever thought of that. Might be time to think out of the box. At first they told us that he told us, as well as many other people, that they thought there had to be someone else involved, but now they're backing away from that and saying, well, you know, the hotel says that lots of people, it's not unusual for a lot of people to come in and bring a lot of luggage. He had a shooting platform, folks, two shooting platforms, thousands of rounds, 20 anywhere from 24 to 28 weapons, whoever you believe, high-tech video equipment, drills. He also had, as we learned from the press conference, a Kevlar suit, bulletproof Kevlar suit that was not just a bulletproof Kevlar suit, it was also flame retardant, fireproof. He had a fireproof, bulletproof suit. What was he planning on doing? Starting a fire and then exiting during the confusion of the fire, going out and pulling the smoke alarm? I've seen that in a couple of movies. And this may have been a Hollywood production, who knows. There are some people out there saying, uh, of course, you always get these people that uh, there were uh, fake actors, uh, um, you know, that type of thing. I don't believe for a single minute there was any fake actors. Those are real people that got shot and killed. Those were not crisis actors. Don't know why the crisis actors always come up, but my friends, it was no crisis actors. There may have been some actors, but it wasn't the people who got killed. There may have been some actors in, in this particular play, but there was none who were the uh, 
who were the victims. Those are real people. Many of them are dead now. Their families will tell you they're real. I guarantee you that. Many of them in the hospitals recovering, they'll be the first to tell you was that they, they are not crisis actors. But anyway, just interesting that he had this explosives out in his car. Binary explosives, meaning didn't need anything else. They were ready to go. Fire retardant suit. He's drilling a hole in the wall, we assume, to as a lookout to plug a camera or just to be able to look out through it or maybe even to put a gun in the hole. He never completed drilling the hole according to the sheriff. But these new facts that are being released are beginning to strangle the life out of the narrative. It's, it's just not standing up anymore. Do not be distracted by the disinformation. Remember, count the brass. Count the length of the shot bursts. These will give us numbers which can be plugged into a mathematical equation and we can figure out whether or not we had a lone shooter. If they want to bring in acoustic experts to examine, which they should, the audio, the capture of the sounds, we can probably get a really good idea where those shots came from. My, my personal belief is that the first initial shots came from two different locations and that they finished up with the shots coming out of the Mandalay Bay Hotel. That was the grand finale. That was to direct people's attention there, while the other shooters, who probably did 90% of the damage, escaped in the chaos. While the police are down in the crowd looking for the shots are coming from, these guys are finishing up their job, packing up their cases, taking their fully automatic assault weapons, sniper we weapons, whatever they've got, and they're fleeing the scene with full cover. And the trap is set. And then as Johnny Fivefinger commented on the previous video, this could have been another one of these crazy sting operations that went bad. It could have been a gun buying deal that went bad. It could have been that Mr. Paddock was set up. It could have been that someone put a bullet in his brain an hour before the thing even started. He probably slept through the whole thing. 72 minutes for the police to get there, even though they knew about a shooting on that floor six minutes before the actual shooting began. Plenty of time to get somebody up there. There should have been nobody out in the crowd, no cops going, where's the shooting coming from? They should have known a long time ago. They had somebody shot up there. Six to seven minutes before the shooting even started, they knew there was somebody shooting up there. This narrative is not working out anymore. Another question you have to ask yourself is that up until now the narrative has been that the shooting stopped because the security guard came up there and interfered with the alleged shooter's activities. And he was distracted, so he fired 200 rounds into the door. We should find those 200 rounds of brass as well, which makes surely we have at least 800 rounds of brass that should be in the room. Because that's what the police said. He fired 200 rounds into the door. So the original narrative was is that the security guard coming up there is what caused him to stop shooting. But if the security guard, we now learn from the sheriff in his press conference, if the, if the security guard was shot six minutes before he even began shooting on the crowd, then why did Mr. Paddock, the alleged shooter, stop shooting? Why did he stop shooting? And if he had a flame retardant suit, a bulletproof flame retardant suit, and he had an escape plan, why didn't he, after he stopped, plan his escape? Why did he shoot himself in the mouth? Do you pack your luggage for a, for a vacation down to the coast and then drive your car purposely off a bridge in your hometown? Probably not. This reminds me an awful lot of 9-11. Same type of crazy stuff. That don't add up. Does not add up. As I mentioned, um, this creepy FBI dude that was standing behind the sheriff, almost like he was watching him to make sure the sheriff said what he was supposed to say or didn't say something he wasn't supposed to say. Kind of a creepy looking guy. Didn't say anything during the press conference 
One time, the sheriff turned around to ask him about something, and the FBI guy said, mm -hmm. Now, this FBI guy is Aaron Kraus. He was appointed about a year or so ago to be the head of the Las Vegas FBI, the bureau chief. He was appointed by James Comey, the dishonorable James Comey. And prior to his being appointed there, do you know what his former position was at the FBI? Mr. Kraus was formerly the head of counterintelligence at FBI headquarters. Why do you go from being head of FBI counterintelligence at FBI headquarters to a bureau chief position? It's a downgrade. That's a very good question. Why did he go from the head of counterintelligence FBI headquarters to a bureau chief in Las Vegas, appointed by James Comey? Hmm. That's a very interesting question, isn't it? Well, that's what the press conference revealed. We can chew on that for a couple of days because it looks like the next press conference won't be until Friday. But until then, we'll continue to review more and more video of more and more people talking about more and more shooters in locations a mile away from there, SWAT teams coming in, telling everybody to hit the ground, people seeing other shooters, hearing other shooters. This thing is just crazy. And I've always said that these false flag operations, I've been watching them for years, and these types of government operations, sting operations and things and such that go bad, you know, I've been saying for years that one of these days they're going to get caught. I mean, they really got caught in Fast and Furious. But uh, Eric Holder flat out refused to comply and the Obama AG, of course, uh, wasn't going to do anything about it. <laughs> I mean, the Attorney General, what's the Attorney General's office going to do? Prosecute the Attorney General? No. They got cock blocked. Eric Holder got away. The ATF got away. The FBI got away. The crime went unsolved, even though everybody knows what happened with Fast and Furious. Johnny Fivefinger may be right. This may have been a some sort of a sting gone bad. Who knows? But it looks like to me that Mr. Paddock was a drunk and a and a uh, gambling addict and a patsy. That's what it looks like to me. Alrighty, more Towergate news not related to the Las Vegas shooting. It appears that Dana Rohrbacher, very frustrated with the cock blocking that was done by John Kelly, not allowing him to have a meeting with the president to discuss Julian Assange, requesting a pardon in exchange for providing the proof that Russia did not hack the DNC. It appears now that Dana Rohrbacher has gone to his close friend, Senator Rand Paul, who's pretty close to the president. They've become very close. And uh, they speak three, four times a week, mostly regarding the health care situation. Trump is a big fan of Rand Paul's idea for these health care co-ops. And they could be done by simply executive order. They wouldn't even need to pass to Congress. And... Uh, so there's a lot of movement in that area, and that's why Trump is optimistic about something happening with Obamacare, because he's been working quite a bit and talking quite a bit with Rand Paul. So Rohrbacher has a conversation with his good friend Rand Paul and asks Rand Paul, he says, hey, you know, I tried to get a meeting with the president on this deal with Assange, proving the Russian narrative is bullshit, and uh, I got blocked by John Kelly. He will, he will not... In fact, they didn't even tell the president that I was even interested in having this conversation. The president didn't even know any of this. And he says, I know you talk to the president a couple times a week. Would this be something you'd be interested in taking up with the president? And Rand Paul said he would. He thinks it's a very good idea. There were other people present at that meeting. Rand Paul had, Rand Paul had three of his staffers there. Rohrbacher had one staffer and a journalist. And they've all concluded that this is what happened in that meeting. So the next time that Rand Paul talks to Trump, which is pretty regularly, he's going to talk to President Trump about this possible pardoning. Or at least Rohrbacher is saying now that Assange doesn't even necessarily need to be pardoned. He just needs a promise that he will not be prosecuted. 
if Trump will promise him that he will not prosecute Assange, and Assange will produce the evidence that Russia did not hack the DNC or the DCCC or the election. Many of you probably have already seen Project Veritas. They have now dropped a bombshell, their newest. James O'Keefe doing a hell of a job over there at Project Veritas. The newest focus is on the old gray lady. That's right, the New York Times. He's now got on video a New York Times audience, the chief audience strategist for the New York Times, a man named Nick Dudick, bragging about being anti-Trump, uh, talking about having a history as being part of uh, Antifa, suggesting that he was working for the FBI, infiltrating Antifa. He also claimed at one point he was uh, Comey was his godfather, but now he's backed away from that. But uh, this certainly un uncovers more uh, corporate media collusion, more corporate media corruption. Nothing we all don't know, but it's nice to have the proof. And according to Project Veritas, James O'Keefe, they have more video. They're just waiting to see how the New York Times responds. How they should respond is to immediately fire Mr. Dudick. That's how they should respond. He's got more video, and we'll be watching Project Veritas in the next few days and weeks to see what comes out of this. But the New York Times has fallen on very, very hard times. There's a lot of problems there. A lot of problems at the New York Times. <clears throat> Well, everybody is turning on Mr. Weinstein, everybody, it appears, Matt Damon, Obama, the Rotten Reverend even came out and gave a three-sentence criticism of the pervert Mr. Weinstein, and now you have three women coming out and claiming actual rape, forced rape, against Mr. Weinstein, and his wife is done with him. He said they had an arrangement. I guess not. She's going to be having an arrangement. It's going to be an arrangement where a lot of cash will be transferred from his bank account into hers. That's the next arrangement that will be happening for Mr. Weinstein. Lots of Hollywood starlets now are coming out to tell their stories. Lots of Hollywood starlets were forced to engage in some pretty nasty things that I'm not even going to talk about on this video. You can use your own imagination. Let's just say that Mr. Weinstein much like the Rotten Reverend's husband, Slick Willie the pervert, rapist himself, her chief of staff, Huma Abedin's pervert husband, who's on his way to prison, Mr. Epstein and all his friends at the Kitty Island there. These are some nasty people. This is who Rotten Reverend hangs out with. The Rotten Reverend Clinton wants to know why she lost. What happened? It's not what happened, it's what's happening with the Rotten Reverend. What's happening with the Rotten Reverend and her association with so many perverts, rapists, misogynists, all the things that she accuses Trump of? She's married to a man that's been proven guilty of much worse. She's friends with a lot of people who've been proven to have done much worse, including her close friend now, Mr. Weinstein, big, big donor. You think she'll give back the money Mr. Weinstein donated to her? Do you think Obama will give back the money that Mr. Weinstein donated to him? Do you think Michelle Obama will come out and talk about that? I'm sure she bought a lot of nice things with a lot of that money donated by the pervert Mr. Weinstein. He's toast. Well, my friends, just as I told you, I was correct. Mr. Chopa, also correct, and, and some other people. I can't remember all your names, but quite a few of us uh, here at Towergate were perfectly 100% correct when we predicted that Mr. Goodell of the NFL would finally have to eat crow and come out and make sure that those players stand for the national anthem. Well, they got the ratings in for Monday night, not good. Another thing, Anheuser-Busch had been running an 800 telephone number for people to call in and tell them whether or not they think that Anheuser-Busch should still continue to advertise with ESPN and the NFL. And NBC, I think, carries the games. Now, I meant to give that number on one of my YouTube videos but because the Las Vegas thing broke out, it's just another one of many stories I did not get to cover. But I did actually call the toll-free number and give my opinion, and I was going to give it to all of you. 
but it doesn't look like it became necessary because it appears that the calls overwhelmingly were opposed to Anheuser-Busch continuing. They, of course, are Budweiser, continuing to advertise with the NFL as long as they continue to support the kneelers. So what happened was Monday night, this is just me thinking, Monday night, the ratings came in and finally Anheuser-Busch, probably had, having had conversations with other major advertisers, called Mr. Goodell on Tuesday morning and probably said, Roger, Roger, game is up. You straighten this thing out, you've got about a week or we cancel our ads. So today, Mr. Goodell came out with an official statement to all of the owners and players regarding the meeting they're going to be having here in about a week, telling them the subject of the meeting would be the National Anthem, standing for the National Anthem. And he's he did a lot of wordy, you know, butt-kissing and things like that. But for the most part, Mr. Goodell is in the first step of eating crow. Trump won big time. He won this fight big time. And the liberal media and the NFL and all the lefties who supported it, lost bigly, bigly. And believe it or not, you now have this idiot who started it all. You have the idiot who started it all, Colin Kaepernick, now coming out and saying, if he gets a shot to play for another NFL team, he'll stand for the anthem. <laughs> so not only did Trump get all the owners and all these other players and all the other people to finally have to deal with it and have to... And have to uh, uh, backpedal and stand for the national anthem he's actually he's actually was so successful that even the guy who started it all is now saying that he's going to stand for the national anthem if he ever gets a shot to play for another team in the nfl and i put the odds of that very low he sure as hell won't be coming to our city i can promise you that fans would revolt of course nothing funnier than trump challenging tillerson to an iq test that is really funny if you remember, there was a, uh, you know, a flap about a week ago about Tillerson calling Trump a moron. And, uh, of course, they're probably having some fun with it. They don't take that kind of stuff seriously. And, you know, it's, uh, it's you know, just people talking. But Trump loves tweaking the media. And I can't believe they continue to fall for it time after time after time. They fall for it. So just to tweak them really bad, he tweeted out <laughs> today, or for you guys, it was yesterday, he tweeted out that he would challenge Tillerson to an IQ test <laughs> and suggested he would win. That is funny. That is freaking hilarious watching the media melt down over that one. It's amazing. And of course we have that idiot Fareed Zakaria who I've already done a bit of an expose on proposing tough, harsh new gun control laws. The only problem with Mr. Zakaria, Zakara, Fareed Zakara's uh, the only problem with his presentation is that damn near everything he said, about 98% of everything he said that he proposed for new gun control laws, already exist. Already exist. And finally, Slick Willie, the rotten reverend's rotten husband, doesn't like the rotten reverend Clinton's book. He doesn't like Hillary's book, it's been, and, and I think he may have advised her against even writing that book, but he says it makes her sound angry and confused about how things worked out. It sure does. It drives the final nails in her coffin. She is done, done, done. Thank you so much for tuning in to this evening's Towergate. I'll be back with you tomorrow. We'll keep following events as they play themselves out. You guys have a good night. Thank you for tuning in. Bye.